Good morning, Hinsdale, Phil, Ann. It's been a long time coming, but I'm, I've come back to my home. I've come back to where I grew up. I've come back to where the people know me here. It's wonderful to be back. For those who do not know, I am David Kilatan. I was born and raised by the people of this church. Uh, everything that I am today... Part of it has to do with the way I was raised here. Um, it's good to be back. I'm going to pray really quick before I begin our sermon, Father. Father God, I pray that you empty me of myself, Lord, and that you fill me with you. This is not my sermon to preach, Lord. This is not my message. It's yours. So I pray that you speak it today and not me. Father God, be with me. Fill me. Empty me of myself. Fill me with you. In your name I pray. Amen. So before I begin, I want to lay down this. I, I use this, this, this illustration a lot. It's the way I understand the Bible. It's the way I kind, of, I kind of see things through this lens. It's one of the ways that you can kind of break up the Bible into parts and kind of see it overall. I love to look at things. I love to look at, at puzzles. And I, I, when I find them confusing, I like, to, I like to lay them out on the table in, the, in their different parts. And try to see the greater picture of everything, this helicopter view of the Bible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain this to you. So the way I see the Bible is set up into, into three basic parts. Okay, so we have, we, we have what we know as Genesis, the, the story of Genesis. In the very beginning, what happened? God what? God created. We have this, this idea of creation. And in this, in this creation, we have the perfect world. We have perfection here. And then we rush over to the very other end of the Bible, over here, and we see what? In Revelation, the very end of Revelation 21 and 22, what does it look like to you guys? It's a recreation of, of earth, of the, new, of, of the new earth, the new Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's God recreating things. And, 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 and in, 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 uh, in the very end of it, it says that every tear is wiped away. There will be no more dying, no more sickness, no more pain. And what does that look like to you? In one word, perfect. It's perfect. We have perfection over there. We have perfection over here. It's kind of this sandwich. And right in the middle, we have what we know as the Gospels. And we have God from heaven coming down into our realm of existence, teaching us, guiding us, showcasing His love. And what would we say He lived? A life of what? Perfection. And so the way I see the Bible is perfection at the beginning, perfection right in the middle, and perfection at the very end. And each, sec- each middle of these little sections are guiding us to the next point. So everything that's going on in the Old Testament here is pushing us to this view of perfection here. And Jesus Christ, as He lives and as He dies in His, in his 33 years of life, in His 3 years of ministry, He's pointing us to this over here. He's saying, remember... You have, we're getting here. We're, we're going here. This is, this is, this is our, our end point. But remember. Remember what goes on here. Because what Jesus is actually saying is He's saying, in order to get where we're going, we have to remember where we came from. And so today, the, the topic of today's sermon is the way God leads in the past. So I'll be talking a lot about this area of the Bible and and how it points towards something. So that's the way I see the Bible. So the, I'm going to move on towards these illustrations that I'm going to be talking about. These different stories in the Bible that I'll be talking about. I'm, I want to first open up to, to Exodus. The story of Moses. And we'll see how God leads. So open, the, open that book up with me. One of my favorite stories to read is the book of Exodus. Moses' story. You saw a little bit in the scripture reading today. And so, for those who are not sure exactly what the story of Moses is, Moses was a pharaoh in Egypt, but then things happened. Synopsis, he left, went to the wilderness, and like one of my favorite movies, he, 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 he goes into the mountain and he sees a burning bush, and in the burning bush is God himself. The entirety of God in a bush that's burning and on fire. So we're going to pick up chapter 3, verse 7. 
We'll, we'll go to verse 5. Do not come any closer, God said. You are standing on holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at the Lord. Verse 7. This is my favorite part. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Who is concerned? God says, I'm concerned about their suffering. God sees something wrong, and He wants to correct it. And this is how He does it. This is His leading. We're at verse 8. So I have come down to rescue them. What did He say there? Did He say, Moses, you're to rescue them? No, God says, I'm the one. I've come down to rescue them. It's not anyone else here. See, the, the, the way I see the Bible is, is, is a story of, of God trying to reinstate the things that were. Trying to get us ready for what's going to be reinstated, the recreation of the earth, the recreation of ourselves. And God takes steps. He, he takes steps to work His way and He, he kind of tiptoes away evil, around evil, really, really gently, securing our free will, but he says, I'm the one. See, the whole idea of the Bible was, well, the, the original idea was that in the beginning, in perfection, it was a, what's called a theocracy. Not a democracy or a, or a republic, but a theocracy, a, 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 a nation led by God and God himself. That's what it looked like. And so when he sees things that are wrong in our lives right now, what he does is he goes, I'm going to be the one that's going to save. It's not anyone else. And so what does he say to Moses? We're going to keep reading. I've come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. We're going to reach, skip over to, to verse 9. And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians have oppress them. So now go. I'm sending you. And in this story, Moses is is fighting. Oh, well God, well God, in verse 12 he says, uh, I'm not sure exactly, Uh, verse 11 says, uh, who am I? Who am I to go to a Pharaoh and tell him what to do? And what, how does God lead here? He says, I'm, I'm gonna be the one with you. See, the first instance of the way I see God leading is that He already has a plan. He already has a way to do it Himself. What He's asking us is not, not, to, not to try to come up with ways, oh, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? How are we going to achieve this? Oh, what if they don't listen? God says, it's already done. Everything that I've already... See, the thing is with God is He, he thinks in perfection. In perfection, not imperfection. He thinks in perfection. His thoughts are perfect. The way he sees him s- s- rescuing the Israelites is a perfect rescue plan. Because he's the one doing it. And so we go out through our lives and we, we, we try to come up with different schemes of how to, how to self-help. But God is all, only saying, when are you going to let me in? When are you going to let me lead again? And so Moses, I don't have time to go through the, the whole story of Moses, but they battled back and forth, back and forth. I don't know if I can do this. God says, I'm with you. Oh, uh, what if they don't listen to me? They'll listen to you. And so they go back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And God is keep, keep, keeps reminding Moses, don't worry, I have a plan. It's going to be me. It's going to be me. And so we keep going. I want to also look at the story of David. I'm going to jump around a lot just to see glimpses, little snapshots of of God's leadership in the the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So we're going to take a look at the story of David. But more importantly, I want to take a look at the the story of Saul because, because, like I said, the original state of, uh, of humanity was supposed to be a theocracy, God ruling. But a lot of times in, in, in human, in human history, in humanity, we think that we could do it. We think we have the plans for everything. The story of Israel in, in, in 1 Samuel was um, 
At first they wanted judges. God, God set up judges to rule the land. And then the, the Israelites were like, you know, we want to be like everyone else. We want a king. And God says, don't worry, I, I, don't, I, I, can, I can do this myself if you guys want. And they're like, no, 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 we want to be like everyone else. We want a king. We want a king. So God's like, okay, sure. You guys can have Saul. He's, he's, a, he's a really good guy. But um, let me let you know what it's going to be like when you have a king. When it's not me who's leading. He's going to send your sons off to war. He's going to tax your land. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna work all your fields. You're going to have basically nothing. You're going to be warring the entire time. Do you still want a king? Israel says, yeah, Jesus, I, got I, I, I do, we, we want a king. And so they written, so, so God, God becomes flexible. His leadership is flexible with us. So at first, he does have a plan. But the thing is, humans don't always like that plan, so we want to develop our own plan. We want something that everyone else has. And God says, sure, if you want... I'll give it to you. This is a guy. And so he brings up Saul. And the thing is with Saul is that he was good at first. God saw a lot of potential in Saul. He said, this could, this could be a good king. He, said, he says, you could, you're going to lead these people. You're going to be the prince of this land. You're going to help lead, lead Israel because that's what they want. I'm going to be flexible with their decisions and I'm going to work with their decisions. But what happens to Saul? Somewhere along the line, Saul kind of goes off. And in, in uh, I believe it's chapter 12, where he, he makes a, a sacrifice that's, that's, not, that's not good. He, makes, he, he sacrifices something on an altar that's, that's, not, that's not mandatory of God. And what, God sa- what, what Samuel says to Saul, he says, You would have been great, Saul, but then you did this. You would have been great. You would have been able to lead. He says, God would have set in stone for you to lead forever. But something went wrong. Saul tried to lead by his dominance and his power. Saul was a good warrior. He tried to lead that way with his power. And that's where God says, I reject you as king. And so the people, instead of saying, God, we want you to be as king. We went, no, 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 God, can you find us another one? And so he sends Samuel, he sends Samuel to, to go find David. And he, he goes to his hometown, oh, not to David's hometown. And everyone there is kind of scared, kind of worried about what's, because back then prophets weren't always the bringer of good news. So they said, are, are, you here, are you here to speak destruction? Samuel's like, no, no, no. I'm here to look for someone that God has chosen. See, the thing is, when we let God start to lead, when we, when we relinquish our, our, any semblance of control that we have in ourselves, when we say, I give up my idea of controlling, God says, good. Let me bring in store someone else. So he brings this guy, David. David, a man after his own heart. Now, I don't, as well as, as Moses, I don't have to go in depth. I don't have time to go in depth with, with David's story. But the point I want you guys to understand is that God sees things in advance. And He sees the outcomes of things in advance. Not, not, he's, not, he's not a linear God. He's, he sees all outcomes. And so what He says with, with, uh, with, with Samuel, Samuel is crying in, in chapter 16. And he's, he's mourning. He says, oh, Saul was supposed to be so good. Why is he gone? I thought Saul was going to be great, God. Why, why is he gone now? Why isn't he leading? And God's like, Samuel, why are you crying over this dude? What's wrong with you? Why are you, why are you mourning over Saul? I've rejected Saul. Look what he says. We're going to take a look at it. Chapter, chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. Go ahead and open your Bibles up. Chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? This is kind of the same type of thing we look at with Moses. And he says this, Fill your horn with oil and go. Moses kept making excuses. Moses kept saying, I'm, I'm not worthy enough. Moses saying that I, I, they'll never listen to me. And God says, it's already done. Just go. 
Samuel's over here and he's like, why didn't Saul work out? Why didn't, we're going to be lost. How come, how come this is happening? And God says, why are you, why are you, why are you so disturbed? Fill up your horn and go. And Samuel goes and he finds David. And, but first he goes through the whole line of Jesse's children. The whole line of his children. And he says, no, that's not the one. Oh, that guy looks really strong. How about this guy? No, he's not the one. Are you missing someone? And, and, and Jesse goes, I mean, there's David. He's out in the field. He's just playing with his sheep. And what is, what is God? And oh, when, when they see him, God says, this is the one. This is the one that what? I have chosen. See, what, what, what happens in that story is, is Jesse and, and, and Samuel are looking at, at all the kids. are like, oh, it could, that could be a, a good fit. Yeah, I, I like that one. He's really strong. No, that's not him? Okay, how about this guy? This guy's he's really tall. He has good leadership qualities. He has you know, bright green eyes and nice flowy hair. That guy's, that guy's good, right? No, that's not the one? Well, how about this guy? How about this guy? We, it's, like, it's almost like they, they, they had a, a, a search committee. And they were, they were, they were, they were interviewing all the, the possible pastors. Oh, is this the one? This is the one, right? Yeah, let's take him, let's take him. No, it's not it? Okay. And the search committee is going on. Jesse and Saul are, Samuel are, are, are going back and forth and they're trying to figure out who's who and what's what and who's the best leader for what. And, and, and under their noses is possibly the least, in their eyes, the least qualified, not the, not the greatest in shape, Probably a lot like me, kind of, kind of pudgy right down here. It's that Filipino uncle gene that everyone is bound to get at some point. He probably didn't, he probably looked a lot like me, just, just this regular guy. He's just like, oh, he's just tending to sheep. You don't want anything to do with him. And, and God's like, yes, I do. I do, in fact. You know why? Because that's the one that I have chosen. God is flexible with our history. He's flexible with our decisions. Yes, we wanted a king. He says, fine, I'll, I'll give you a king. He's going to be bad. And people are like, yes, we'll go on, we want a king. He goes, okay, that, that one failed. Now we want a new king. And the thing is, they were looking at Jesse's children the same way they looked at Saul. Saul was strapping, built like, like, like Quiranjo, really built, really sturdy, just in shape. And then they looked at Jesse's and they probably looked at the same type of thing because they think that they have the keys to leadership. Churches think that we have the keys to leadership. I'm a pastor at Bolingbroke Church down the street. And we always hear people like, oh, you guys got it. You guys got it. You guys can do it. You guys have got things right. But if you ask me and Justin what goes on during the week, we're like, I don't know what we're going to do. The key to leadership is not finding good leaders amongst people. It's saying, hey God, who do you choose? Who do you want to be here? We're going to keep going. So we, we, looked at, we looked at Moses over here. We looked at Moses and we, we saw that, that, that God has a plan. He's the one who's going to be doing it himself. And then we have, we have, we have David over here and we have the people of Israel saying, Saying, oh, we, we know what we want. God's saying, <laughs> you really don't. This is who I choose. God is flexible. His leadership is flexible. I want to take a look at one last story in the Old Testament. One of my favorite stories. The story of Abraham. Now, Abraham is an awesome story. I think it's really cool. And I want to open up to Genesis. It's cool when you see Genesis. Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4 covers about... It's, it's all of creation. And then from, from 4 all the way to chapter 12, you see the writer of, of Genesis writing as fast as he can because he wants to get somewhere because he goes through about 2,000 years of history. And then he gets to Genesis 12 and he slows down really slow because he wants to really go in depth to this one guy. His name is Abraham. So we're going to take a look. Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. Sorry, Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And he said this to Abraham. Don't be afraid. 
I am your shield. I am your great reward. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, how can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Elijah of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Now, what he's talking about here, it's, 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 it's in, the la- in chapter 12 where, where God makes a covenant with Abraham. And he says to Abraham, he says, I will make you into, what, who, who's going to make him into a great nation? I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Verse, chapter 12, verse 2. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse whoever curse you. It is through me that you will spring up this nation of Israel. Now, now at this time, Abraham had no idea the children he'd had, he was going to have in the future. He had no idea of Isaac. He had no idea of Jacob. And he had no idea of Israel. But see, the thing is, 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 is God is he's always pointing towards something. All of, of that Old Testament, Jesus says this. He goes, you know the things that you're reading of? He says to the Pharisees, you know who they're talking about? They're talking about me. So we look at the story of Abraham. We look at the story of Abraham, and, 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 and the Bible tells us that as the story unfolds, he does have a son named Isaac. And then one day, God says to Abraham, I want you to kill that son. Now, a lot of, a lot of atheists try to use this, this story against Christianity and say, God is not a great God if he wants you to kill his children. But if we know now, if, if, anyone, if anyone heard a voice now that says, go kill your children, no one would listen to it. We would say, that's not God, that's someone else. I won't follow him. But at this point, Abraham hears a voice that he's never heard, an order he's never heard that says, you know that son you have? The only son that you have? I want you to sacrifice him. And so the story unfolds and, 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 and Abraham goes up the mountain and he has two servants with him. And right before he gets to the altar, he says to, to his servants, he goes, stay here. Me and my son, we are going to go up and worship. And then what does he say afterwards? He says, we will come back. There's something in Abraham's head that's a lot different than Moses and David. Moses and David should have learned from Abraham. There's something in Abraham's head that's saying, I'm going to give up my control. I'm not going to let human reason dictate my life. I'm not going to let my reason dictate my life. I'm not going to let my leadership and my, my mind rule. I'm going to let God rule this time. I'm going to give it all up. I'm not going to try to control it. So he brings, he brings up Isaac up to the altar and he's, he puts in place the wood. And Isaac looks at his dad and he goes, Dad, where's... I, I see the wood. I see the knife. Dad, where's the lamb? And then what does Abraham say? He said, don't worry, son. God will provide a sacrifice. Because in Abraham's head, something is going on. Because he remembers, he remembers the promise that God made him. He says, you are not going to give your estate to your servant. I'm going to give you a son. Remember that, remember that promise I made with you in chapter 12? I will make you a great nation. That promise still holds. The thing about God's leadership is when he promises something, he does it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about his promises they will happen. Abraham had that in his heart. He knew that in his mind. That God doesn't let up his promises. If God, if God is going to say, sacrifice my son, somehow something's going to work out, and I will still have a son. I will still have a nation in front of me. And so he lifts up the knife. And he has Isaac on the altar, and he lifts it up, and he's about to do it. And, and the, the, one, of the, one of the most awesome plot twists is a hand comes out, stops him, and he says, Abraham, don't. And what does God say that he's going to do after that? He says, I will be the sacrifice. I will, I will provide the provisions. I will be the one that you are going to slay. 
And this is all because he wants to point towards something. The, the Old Testament, every single story is pointing towards something ahead. Like I said before, perfection here and everything here is pointing towards the next bit of perfection here. And Jesus Christ is, is working. He's, he, he sacrificed himself and he gives his order to the church and says, Tell these people about the promise that I have in the future. Get them here. It's all pointing somewhere. The Bible is a narrative story. It begins somewhere. And it's going somewhere. And God is leading us. And so Abraham, as he says, uh, he, he's about to kill him. He says, no, I will be the sacrifice. It's because he's pointing towards a Messiah. You look in Daniel 9 and Daniel's prayer. He says, oh, great, wonderful, awesome God. You who keeps the covenant. It's you who keeps the covenant. It's not us. We can try. We can try our best to lead. We can try our best to do everything. But in, in the, the grand scheme of things, it's not us doing it at all. It's only God saying, oh, I, I've already made the provisions. I've already made the adjustments. I've already planned this all out. My people are already rescued. You guys are already rescued. Are you willing to say, I give up and I'll give it to God? And so we look at, at what Abraham is pointing to when he says that I will be the sacrifice. Abraham looks and he looks at, uh, at, at, this, at, at the bush and there's a, there's a ram there that's, that's caught and he sacrifices that ram and the story unfolds and him and Isaac, just like a goddess says, they came down from that mountain. He was pointing towards Jesus. The real sacrifice that's going to happen in the future. And so... I look at the life of Jesus. I look at the, I look at the things that he did. I want you guys to open up. To John, the book of John. Now this story, this, this John chapter 6 is a story about the, 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 the loaves and the fishes. Now it's in every gospel, but I love the way John puts it. It's in every gospel, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all kind of see the same exact thing when it comes to this story. But John says it's a little different. John says it a little different. We're going to start reading. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed the far shore of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he performed on the sick. And Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down amongst his disciples. We're going to jump down. Verse 5. And then Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd toward, coming towards him. And he said to Philip, and it's a man Jesus kind of sitting and Philip's, Philip's right next to him. And he sees all these people coming towards him. He looks at Philip and he goes, Philip, where shall we buy bread for those to eat? Where are we going to do that? Phil, hey, Philip, do you know where, how we're going to feed all these people? And then John puts it this way. John says, he asked only to test him for he knew what he already had in his mind and what he was going to do. God looks at, at Philip and he says, do you know what we're going to do? And Philip's like, oh man, I don't know. It's going to take, it's going to take a lot of money, a lot of time. I don't, I, Jesus, I'm not sure if we can feed these people. And God, Jesus says, I thought he would get it. I thought he would say, we're not going to feed these people, but you're going to feed these people. And so the story goes on and and Philip says, eight months' wages, not enough to buy bread for one bite. Another disciple, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five loaves of, here's a boy with five loaves of barley and two small fish, but how far are they going to go among so many? Do you see what happened there? Do you see what happened? <laughs> Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. He had the worst idea out of anyone there. He's like, here's five loaves and some fish. And Jesus is like, that's it. Give me the impossible. Give me the impossible tasks here. It's crazy because later on in, 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 this, uh, in this chapter, Jesus talks about how he's the bread of life. He says, I'm the bread. And so, and so Simon, he, he brings this, this bread. Oh, man, he has such terrible ideas. He, this guy goes out through the whole, the, whole, the whole New Testament with Jesus. And Jesus is like, oh, come on, man. Again? Really? But Jesus uses him the most. Because he has the worst ideas. 
And us as leaders are trying to figure out what are the best ideas. How can, we, how can we plan? How can we get this into a system? How can we do this? How can we do that? How can we do this? We have to be perfect. It has to be like this or else it's not going to happen at all. But Jesus says, really? We'll talk about this a little later. So, so he gives the bread to the bread of life. He brings the, the resource to the source. Do you see what happened there? He brings, the, the, he brings life-giving food to a life-giver, and what happens? Passes it. Breaks it off. Passes it. Passes it. Breaks it off. Passes it. And then it doesn't say everyone just had a bite to eat. What did it say? Everyone had as much as they wanted. They came to Philam Church. They had a potluck. That's what happened. They had as much as they wanted. I missed, man, I missed that potluck. I'm telling you right now. They had as much as they wanted because of a really bad idea. A horrible idea. Simon Peter's brother, what are you going to do with a few loaves and some fish? Peter, that's a terrible idea. How many times have we shot down bad ideas because they're bad ideas? Which brings me to my last point about how God leads. Could have Jesus... Could Jesus have miraculously, with um, a miracle, made a bunch of bread and fish? Was that in his power? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's not the way God leads. He doesn't lead with his dominance. He doesn't lead with his power. Does he have the ability? Absolutely. He can do whatever he wants. But to think about the God that I, I serve under, to think about the God that I follow, The thing about the God that leads me is that He doesn't lead by power. He leads by love. And the ultimate source of that, the pinnacle of everything in the Bible comes to this one point where Jesus is on the cross. And at any point, He could have asked legions of angels to come down and pick Him up and take Him out. As He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, He was saying, God, if it's at all possible, can You please take me out of this? He was standing at the gate and Freedom was right in front of him and he could have stepped out and says, I'm done with it. I'll just rewrite everything and he had that in his power. But the thing is with God, the thing about the way he leads in the past is that he doesn't lead with power, he leads with love. He could have gone free that day, but he didn't. Why? Because he loves us. In Ephesians, it says that we are called to do works that that have been set in front of us already. Do you hear that? He says, he says this. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. He says, For we are God's workmanship, created by Jesus Christ to do the good works which God has prepared for us in advance. The thing is with Jesus, the thing is with the gospel, the way you can summarize it is it is finished. It's already done. Jesus has secured our salvation. What happens if all of us have in our minds when we're doing something that we had nothing to lose and everything to gain? What happens to our churches? What happens to our youth? What happens to the world? When God has already done everything, He's made the provisions, He's flexible, He's made all the, all the adjustments to everything, the job is already done, What happens to our mentality after that? When we stop trying to do God's will and just go out and just do it. See, the thing with Moses that that a lot of people don't don't understand about him is he all God was asking him to do was just, just show up. You look at David's life and one of the ways he messed up was he didn't show up to war. Instead, he he chilled out and he just looked at some girl on the roof. And from there you see that's his downfall. Is when doing... Let me try to put this straight. We are not passively doing God's work. We're actively doing it. Do you see the difference there? We're not letting God just do it. God is saying, I've already done it. I just need you guys to do this, to to be there, to be able to activate my will into the world. When When we decide that, yes, I am going to do it, God is like, great, it's already done. Just be there. Now, it's come to my attention that there's, at HA, there's a lot of, of 
people going to the Dominican Republic. Am I correct? How many, how many Hinsdale Adventist youth are here that are going to the Dominican Republic? We have one, two, three, four, five in the back. Anyone else? Five people. Five people that, five seniors that are, are saying we're going to do God's work. Now let me tell you guys this. I'm talking to them now. It's already done. He's asking you to go to bring it into reality. What we're doing when we're allowing God to lead through us is we're, it's almost like we're co-signing the blank checks that God writes to humanity. And we're, we're endorsing them. We're saying, yes, this check is valid. Whatever it takes, God has already made all the provisions. He already paid for everything. Jesus paid it all. And all to Him I owe. I'm going to co-sign this check to, to humanity. And we're going to go out and we're going to do God's will. And so we look at the brokenness of this world. We, when you guys go to the Dominican Republic and you look at the brokenness there, you say, how much does it take to fix? And they'll tell you their needs. They'll tell you their needs. They'll tell you their needs. And God says, I already made all of it. I made it happen already. And so for our church, for this church right here, how are we letting go of our control? In our lives, how are we letting go of control? And see, the cool thing about Abraham was, is, is the reason why God reached out to Abraham first to start the, the nation of Israel is because it says that after he made that promise to him that he, at 75 years old, you're going to have a whole nation of, of people. You're going to have a son that's going to carry forth this nation. What did Abraham say? He didn't fight. He didn't cry. What did he say? He says, all right, I believe you. And it said it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's why in Hebrews it says, look, remember Abraham, his faith? When he just says, I, I just believe. And we look at Jesus and it says, John 3.16, we all know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his over and last only, only begotten son that whoever, what? Just believes. You know why? Because Jesus already said it's finished. That, that phrase echoes throughout all eternity. It's finished. Everything's done. Don't need to worry about how we're going to get there. What we're going to do for food. How are we going to clothe ourselves? Who's going to be the new leader of our church? How are we going to bring this person on to help us further the mission? It's already done. All we have to do is believe in the promise that God says it is finished. And go out and just do it. And I want to do something special. I want to call up Actually, can I, can I have some of the, the kids that are going to the Dominican Republic? You're going to call them up? As you call up, I also want to call some elders up and, and, and the pastors that are here. I want to pray over these people because I want you guys to take a look at, at the, the youth. The youth here are the activators of God's will. We all are. But take a look at these youth right here. As, as, as we lay hands on them and as, as we pray for them, I want you guys to believe that... I want you guys to believe that the work you're doing is already done. When you go there, work with passion. Work like, like you have nothing to lose, like nothing can go wrong because everything in God's mind has gone right. And so as, 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 as the elders lay hands on, on these people, on these young individuals, we're going to pray for them. Let's kneel together. Elders, please lay your hand to our young people as a sign of our support and and prayers. Father in heaven, it is a beautiful day to give to you our commitment to do mission. Father in heaven, we respond to the commission of Christ to go teach, preach, and baptize people. We would like to disciple your people, dear Lord. And so I would like to commit to you, our young people who have dedicated their lives to go for a mission trip. Tomorrow they will be leaving. Father in heaven, I pray for your traveling mercies, that they will be safe and they will be 
able to perform according to your will for their lives. I ask, dear Lord, that this experience will not only transform them, but will make them your disciples to be committed to tell the world of your great love. Not only for the young people today here kneeling with us, but for all those young people of this church. Because I believe when our youth leads, this church is empowered. When our youth is revived, our church is revived. And so, Father in heaven, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit upon their hearts. That they will accept the challenge to go, be sent, and be spent. And so I ask in the loving name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those who love the Lord will say, Amen and Amen. God bless you.